Aloha, everyone. This is Larry Camp, and welcome to the Nobody Knows Your Story podcast, which just happens to come with a side of Hawaiiana. Nobody Knows Your Story is a podcast which I believe will impact each listener in a positive way. As you listen to the experiences that have transformed, shaped, and guided each guest, perhaps you'll better understand your own personal journey. Some will surprise, some will make you question, and some will inspire, but all will leave you in a better place for listening in. As for the Hawaiiana, well, that's just a big part of my life story. So I invite you to check in from time to time, or better still, add Nobody Knows Your Story to your list of favorite podcasts. You'll enjoy hearing the life experiences of people just like you. Welcome to another interesting story, or stories. Yeah, I'm shaking things up today as we start Season 5 of the Nobody Knows Your Story podcast. Now, we just heard the green with the land of love. I want to go where the people know that we're equal even though we're not the same. Please take me to the land of love. What a great message. And if you want to hear the entire song and get your own copy of our mid-podcast song, Drop Baby Drop by the Manoa Company, then please purchase their music. Like I said, I'm shaking things up today. We're doing a little Where Are They Now? with a talk story follow-up. And when I say follow-up, we're going to hear from my very first podcast guest, James Phelps. But this time, we've got his better half, Jolene, here to verify what he's about to convey to us. (laughs) So James and Jolene, welcome to Nobody Knows Your Story. Again, James... Good to be back. The sequel. Yeah. Hey, Larry. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Just remember, you, they were, and just for you guys out there in the land of listening, because you can't see us, they have a microphone they're passing back and forth as they talk today. So I think it's going to work out just fine. We've done a couple of these couples interviews before, and it's always been great. So guys, I just appreciate you taking the time. I mean, we can talk about why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> in St. George. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, it's fun to have you guys here. I'm just going to let you tell your story because the last time you were on, James, you were living on the Big Island of Hawaii. 
That's right. We were, <laughs> but no longer. Our, our heart is still on the island, though. And that's what I tell people when they say, how could you ever move from Maui? I'm like, well, we got priced out of paradise. <laughs> and uh, so for us, it was kind of a, a no-brainer. And I just followed Judy's lead, even though I was you know, kind of kicking and screaming. It was the right move for us at that time. And, and you know, we, we still go back to visit, but yeah, we do miss it for sure. Yeah, same with us. It was an amazing season of life to be there. Sometimes Hawaii is that way. It's it's a season, and then life moves in different directions. It does, and yeah. and I know you guys are doing different things, and that's what we're going to hear about today. So, I mean, you can pick up where you want. We didn't have Jolene with us the first time, so Jolene, maybe what we should do, James, unless okay. you feel otherwise, is just Jolene. Why don't you kind of quickly tell your story? Okay. You know, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I'm actually half Cuban. My mom um, came from Cuba in 1969, along with her mom and four. Um, well, there were four daughters. My mom was the oldest of them. Back then Castro had been in power for about 10 years. It was crazy what they had to experience and just how the indoctrination of the children, um, trying to take religion out of their lives. My mom tells a story of where uh, Cast- they would bring in the, you know, the military or just his gurus into the classrooms and they would tell all the children, hey, pray for an apple and in, in Cuba, an apple is a is a delicacy. It's like a very special treat. So they, of course, the children would pray, and, and the religion of Cubans was Catholicism, and so they were very devout before Castro. Then he would come and say, you know, children pray for an apple, and of course, no apple would show up on their desk. But then they're like, well, ask Castro for an apple, and then they would bring in the apples. So that was just one of the things they were doing to have the children always look to the government and, and not to the, you know, God or even their parents. They definitely, they would remove the children from their homes every summer. They never had like a summer break and they'd have to go work in the sugar cane fields. And so there was just this indoctrination going on to take children from looking to their parents for guidance in their lives and also to just extract God from their lives and look at the government instead. And so, so it had been 10 years and Johnson had the freedom flights. And so the parents, my mom's parents decided it was time to escape communism, but sadly they had an older brother that was military age. So they separated the family would not allow him to leave. So the dad stayed back with the brother and then the mom came with just the clothes on their backs. They came to the United States. So they, they had an aunt, very different from what we're seeing today, where there's just these handouts to everybody that's just deciding to come illegally. Then you had to have a sponsor, a family member or a very good friend that was willing to take you and your family on whoever came and they would, um, you would live with them until you had jobs and you were ready to, you know, embark on your own here in the United States. I think that was the right way to do it. So they worked hard, amazing, funny stories. They didn't know the language. Um, they worked really hard, but they did well. And now, you know, all the the different the sisters, almost all of them, you know, went to college, finished. And then they have like a lot of the extended family. There's a Cuban restaurants that we have in Florida. So if you're ever in Florida, especially in the Southern area, it's called Padrino's Mexican cuisine. I mean, not Mexican, Cuban, <laughs> Cuban, Cuban <laughs> cuisine. Anyway, it's amazing food. It's very good. So beyond that, my mom and her sisters and, and her, my grandmother, they were there in New Jersey. And one day, a couple of missionaries showed up at their door. And, um, you know, this is the free love era, you know, 1969, 70. And so my poor grandmother with four teenage daughters, and they were all really beautiful, um, was very scared. How am I going to keep my daughters safe? And so these clean cut missionaries show up at the door with their standards. She never believed in the Joseph Smith story. She thought it was kind of crazy, but she went ahead and got baptized and the girls did too, just thinking this is a safe place for our daughters. So, um, so they ended up moving from New Jersey, came to Utah, actually, back then, um, all married Mormon, you know, husbands and, uh, and just started raise their families, LDS. So that's what my background is. My dad was generational. 
LDS. Anyway, fast forward many years, James and I get married when we're about 30. And, and you can and, and hear me, his podcast. Yes. yes. Just going to say that. Yeah, because our stories is so funny. We're married, of course, and we're walking through the same thing, but our stories are so different. And what got a hold of us is different for each other. And so, um, anyway, so about 2014, um, a few years before then, my sister and brother both start questioning Mormonism. You know, they're seeing things on the internet and so they start sharing because you know how in Mormonism, they give you this impression that if you leave, your life is going to fall apart. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes it really does, actually, because I think people, the pendulum swings so, so much the other way, like, hey, let's just do whatever we want now. Right. <laughs> so there was a little bit of that going on. But um, I started freaking out. And I'm the oldest of three kids. So um, I started sharing with James. I'm like, oh, my goodness, my brother and sister, they're leaving the church and th- their lives are going to fall apart. And that's when James finally shared that for a few years, he had been actually questioning and he just didn't feel comfortable to share with me. I think he was afraid because many times when some, a spouse does start to question, they actually like the other one says, well, I'm going to leave you if you leave the church. But gratefully, that's not where I was at. Well, and I said to James, I, I, this might've been just today or yesterday, but I said, some people do put their religion above their Mm -hmm. marriage and their relationship. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, then you're right. That can cause a real problem. Yeah. It's sad. I think it's really sad because I just, as James shared, I I just wanted him to be happy. Like I was, it's okay. It was okay to me that we would not be on the same page. And so, um, so he started to share, like, he's like, Jolene, you know, don't be so hard on them. I actually have questions myself. So he started to share the questions and actually for a while that drew us closer together. We'd talk about these questions and I was like, yeah, you've got a point, but I wasn't ready to explore leaving. So in in order to pacify myself, I started to look at the, you know, LDS.org and find my answers on there, like through their apologetics. And for a time I kind of was like stronger, maybe I was even stronger in my LDS faith. But, um, after a while, those questions just, <laughs> there wasn't a good answer anymore. So that was a few years after that. And So that's when like 2014 rolled around. So this part gets a little crazy. So (laughs) my, so our daughter, she was an ice skater. And at that time she had broken her ankle on the ice and she had been competitive and was really just moving up with her ankle breaking. She'd lost that fearlessness. So we were looking for an a new thing for her. She needs something new. And so she'd entered a singing contest and won the first night without even a singing lesson in her life. And so she thought, this is what I want to do. So we thought, you know what? She's about to go to high school. Let's see if we can find like a charter school or something that was kind of focused on the arts. So we found this Mormon private school. It was like a Kimber Academy. And um, we really liked it. And I thought it would work well for her. So we went ahead and signed her up. And I became a good friend with the director of the school. Well, the director of the school, eventually, as we became better and better friends, she started to share with me that she was following this guy named Denver Snuffer, who was, um, you know, there's hundreds of splinter off groups from Mormonism. Well, this is just one of the many. Back then, he had about 2,000 following, like 2,000 people following him. It wasn't very big. It's grown a lot. And he's he's trying to rebrand Mormonism. And uh, it's very interesting. (laughs) But Anyhow, she started to share his books and she's like, I don't think pre-. at the time it was President Monson that was the president, you know, the prophet. She's like, well, I don't believe in, you know, the prophet anymore. And that's when um, Rinsley, our daughter, she's like, I don't either, mom. And I, and I was like, wait a second, I'm not ready to go there yet. <laughs> so it took me about a week, though. It wasn't long to ponder these things and start reading his books. And um, what I, what this group was doing well, like, like why it resonated with me was I didn't like what was currently happening in the Mormon church. I didn't feel like it was good, but somehow in my mind, I thought because they paint this picture of Joseph Smith, like he's perfect, you know, you do you, I don't know if you remember the movie they used to have. It was back in the nineties called legacy. They used to show it at the Joseph Smith oh, yeah. Memorial building. Yeah. I saw it there and it's kind of weird. You know, you have to sometimes say, I'm sorry for what I said when I was Mormon, but <laughs> I actually took a friend of mine, Rylas Graham. I still remember it was Rylas. Yeah. 
And we were up in Salt Lake. We had brought our boys up for a yeah. baseball uh, camp at BYU. And he, he was a never Mormon, still oh. is. And I said, well, hey, let me take you to this movie. <laughs> and, you know, what an awkward position to put him in, right? Because, yeah. you know, so he went. He was gracious and went. But, yes, so I yes. know the movie. I've seen the movie at yeah. least a couple oh. of times. Oh, yeah. I saw it a couple of times. The way they portray Joseph Smith, you make they make him look so good. Like, he's such an amazing man. So that's what was in my mind. I sure. couldn't think that, you know, he was such an evil guy. Um, so, so this kind of satisfied that. It's like the current Mormon church is off, but Joseph Smith is still a good, you know, still a prophet of God, and the Book of Mormon is still true. So, so I liked that. So, and then what was... Why I gravitated towards it is they were doing something that I never experienced in Mormonism, which was um, in- encouraging their people to spend time with God and just to sit and meditate on God and and talk to Him, you know. And and so you know you're kind of taught in Mormonism that that can only take place in the temple, and that's the only place you're really feeling close to God. But I started to realize, no, when you have that time and you're just sitting quietly with God, wow, there's a lot of you know, I was getting a lot out of that. So that's why I gravitated. So I'm like, James, you've got to read these books. Um, yeah. So James, um, he, he went ahead and read his last one at the time, which I think was passing the heavenly gift. And that one was all about the priesthood. And James just said, Jolene, I'm sorry, but I just got a pit in my stomach that, you know, my questions go to Joseph Smith, not, you know, it's not about the current. And so he just couldn't, receive it but at the same which I'm so grateful right now (laughs) back then I was really upset so that kind of started a roller coaster for us um that splinter off group was very interesting I mean they weren't they went back to Joseph Smith like hey let's follow everything that Joseph Smith was teaching and prophesying but not polygamy gratefully um but it was very strange because Denver Snuffer has his own idea that Joseph Smith was not consummating those marriages that he had had that he it was just that the husbands of these women that he that they allowed him to marry and the young girls it was all about connecting to Joseph Smith because he was the conduit to Jesus it was like you i mean just talk about the arrogance right <laughs> that you had to connect to him to connect to god and so um which we know like in the bible when the veil was torn you know in the gospels that that was just each one of us have our connection with Jesus we don't have to go through any man ever um it's it's so beautiful well anyway so back to the story that's in t- so i was really heavily invested in this group and at this time james is like i you know he didn't know what to do so he clung tighter to mormonism and that just made things even worse because i knew he had his questions and so i was in this confusion um eventually it it gets out that these, that there's groups of families that are meeting in home churches, you know, following this Denver Snuffer movement. And so this is in Gilbert, Arizona, kind of, you know, everybody knows everybody. Well, it gets out that we're doing this. And so a witch hunt kind of ensues and they're starting to go after different families and, um, telling them that they have to denounce everything or be excommunicated. And so at that point, I'm like, well, James is not on board with me. Well, I'm not, I know the church is a lie. I'm not going to stay in it. So I'm like, I better just resign before they come after me. And so I just resigned. And oh, James was so upset (laughs) because we're sitting there with the bishop and the state president. And they weren't bad. I I can't say they were mean to us or anything. Um, But the state president just looks at me and he's like, you know, you're breaking all your covenants. You're going to lose your family. I don't. And I just, it was so interesting. I didn't feel anything like bad or crying. I actually felt so peaceful inside. I'm like, I'm not break. I've not broken a single covenant. That is true. And so anyway, so that was it. James was very upset, but we continued forward fighting almost every day though. It was really bad. I this must God. have been around 2015 now. Yes. 2015. Because I remember a trip over to Maui. Yes. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So then, um, we, it was interesting. God started to put people in our life. We had, we were about 42, 43. We didn't know we had never known another Christian in our whole lives. You know, we just only knew LDS, 
you know. So one day we were on our a hike. We went um, to Usury Pass. It was only, it was less than a half. It was like 45 minutes from our house. And we meet this family that um, the husband was from Nepal originally. And the wife was the child of a missionary, of, of a missionary couple that um, lived in Austria for 30 years. And they would, they would drive a little tea bus and stop wherever the Holy Spirit led them. And they would preach the gospel and serve coffee and tea. And just with all the things that were running through my mind as they shared their stories, how this, this, um, the husband, how he came to know Jesus, you know, and left Hinduism and they were very open and really friendly. And so I was like, I need to know more about that. And so I kind of snuck away from James cause the wife, had, they had a baby and she was going to go change the baby's diaper and Rinsley and I went and walked with her. <laughs> and I was like, I really want to know more about your story. And so it turned out that they lived in all this lakes just right around the corner from our house. So like, what are the chances of that? Yeah. So her and I started to walk. They invited us over for dinner one time and showed us the movie, um, Joseph Smith versus the Bible. I think that's what it is. Or the Bible versus Joseph Smith, something like it's on YouTube. It's an older movie, but it's, it's really good. And whoa, that movie, like just, I was crying for like three days because it just broke all my boxes of what I thought was true and Joseph Smith and James was ready to receive it to him. He was like, this is just what he was looking for, but not me. I cried, I fasted and I found a way to shelf it. <laughs> and so James, uh, so the, this continued on and I continued to walk with this friend. She, eventually she knew that we were struggling. So she, invited us to like try out her pastor for as a counselor for marriage counselor and I knew we couldn't go to an LDS one we went ahead and booked uh well she gave us two names one was a secular one and one was the um her Christian pastor and I thought you know that'd be interesting to try so I didn't tell James that was the pastor I just gave him the two names and said I'm kind of leaning towards this one I didn't think he'd want to go if he knew it was a Christian pastor and so he's like okay and he tried to do his research but he you know, because being an attorney, he like looks into everything. He's like, but he couldn't find this guy. <laughs> and so he's like, okay, we'll just try it. So we go and, and it was just such, it was so refreshing. Like this pastor just lived in a very like normal house, you know, it was nice and clean, but it was, you know, you'd always hear the stories in Mormonism. You've got this like, idea that pastors just live high on a hog or just making money off of all their, their, you know, their congregants. And no, this pastor was just a very like normal, uh, farm boy. Like he was just really, he was great, really down to earth. So he heard our stories and, and I really thought he was going to side with me. And so, but he said, he said, Jillian, I'm glad you're seeking truth but you're off. <laughs> so I was really mad. But then he told me, he asked James, like, James, do you believe in absolute truth? And at that moment in his life, James was starting to think, well, maybe there's relative truth. Like, you know, my parents have their truth. Jolene has her truth. My, you know, my, my buddy I play tennis with, you know, he's kind of Buddhist kind of slash Hindu. He doesn't exactly know where he's at. He's kind of picking and choosing. Um, he's like, you know, maybe everybody has their own truth. But he said, like, you know, being an attorney and just knowing like when things contradict each other, you, there, there's got to be a truth in there. There's got to be absolute truth. And so he, that's what he, he's like, well, I want to say there is relative truth, but I think logically I just have to say, no, there's got to be absolute truth. So then the pastor just told him, well, then you've got a responsibility to your family to find it. And, um, I know James probably shared in his uh, message that that really pierced him. And he, decided he needed to go on a journey to figure it out. And so he really started to dig into the Bible, figure out like, can this Bible be trusted? Cause you know how Mormonism were taught, you know, it's the art of one of the articles of faith. That number says, eight. Number eight. Yes. Number eight. Yeah. We believe in the Bible as far as it's translated correctly, which if it can so if the doctrine contradicts, you know, Joseph Smith, <laughs> and they throw it out. Yep. So crazy. But, um, but James found like, there's so much evidence. It's super reliable in the way that it's, it was painstakingly like, uh, you know, translated and just the amount of manuscripts there are for it, that if really, if there was some kind of devious scribe, that everybody would know it immediately. Like, Hey, this one manuscript doesn't match like all them 24,000 more, you know, whatever. So, um, anyway, 
it was just amazing that he, so he'd start to share these things he was finding with me. And even though we were arguing and I was still super in, I was listening, but, um, yeah, there was a lot of arguing still going on at that time. Eventually though, God did start to peel me like an onion. He put this woman in my life that was, a. Uh, uh, she was a, a minister for over 30 years. She, uh, she did her, well, she was a nurse initially, but then she started to study the Bible and she did two doctorate degrees and some of it at Hebrew university in Israel. And so hers was very much of a Hebrew, um, like searching the context of the Bible, the Hebrew roots, you know, there's Hebrew roots can have a, a different meaning too. There's some people that are Hebrew roots, Messianic Jews that are uh, so legalistic that they think if you're not following the Holy days and all these different things that you're actually sinning. Um, she wasn't like that. She wasn't a legalistic one, but, but it was amazing. So we, Vinsley and I started to visit cause we started to get tired of our home church, you know, the Denver Center for home church, because there's something that happens and it's definitely an important part of coming out of Mormonism. You have to go through some healing, like, and some venting and like, cause you feel so lied to for so long and, and it's just a process, but we had been out for a while and Rinsley and I, we were starting to kind of be tired of, of just the negativity of just, just bashing the church and not that we were for them. We weren't, we just wanted to move on. And so we started visiting different Christian churches and we started to find so much joy every time we were visiting a new one. We were like, Oh, let's go visit this one. It was like, it was total fun. We just, it was a blast. So one day we visited one that was a Friday night so we could still go to our Sunday gathering because we were still going to visit with the, the Denver Suffer group and, um, which they call themselves a remnant now. But, uh, so we went to this Friday night service of a messianic Jewish community, you know, church. And that's where we met this woman. And she, um, she did a Bible study the next day, which we're like, oh, we need to go to that. Cause the night that we went, it was a rabbi that came from, that from Israel that spoke. And he, he had an amazing conversion story from, you know, how he became a Jewish believer of Jesus. And that was just, whoa, it just really pierced our hearts. So we're like, let's come back. And then we heard her teach the next day and her, she, it was just amazing. Her, or just the way she taught, which never, we never heard in more. Mormonism, you know, just the story of Abraham and taking Isaac up the mountain to sacrifice his son and how this is just, um, a picture of God walking his son up to Calvary to be sacrificed. Yet God went through with it where he stopped Abraham, but she is sharing this and I never heard it taught like this in Mormonism. So I'm like, Whoa, this is amazing. So Rinsley and I talked to her afterwards. I'm like, can we do a Bible study with you? We're coming out of Mormonism. We really want to learn the Bible. But she was like, she was mourning the loss of her husband and was going through like many, she was having to catch up on her taxes. She had, she was far, um, on her taxes because her husband was, um, suffering from cancer. And so it took, it, it took a while. She needed to catch up quite a few years. I'm like, Oh my goodness. Well, I'm an accountant. And so I'm like, how about I come over and help you and you got, you teach us the Bible. And so we developed this friendship. We would come over almost daily, a couple times a week, at least Rinsley would help organize her library and I would help her with taxes and, and ask her questions. And she was so great. She knew how not to get my walls to go up. She really would never push. She would just wait till I had questions. One day we're in her office. I pull out Kingdom of the Cults, um, that book. Have you, have you seen that one? No. It's an interesting one. So anyway, Kingdom of the Cults. And, and I'm like, well, this sounds like an interesting book. And she's like, oh, there's an interesting chapter on Mormonism in there. I'm like, what? Really? I'm like, but wait, Mormonism is not a cult. And she's like, oh, well, you guys believe you can become gods, right? And I'm like, well, we can. And I was so ready to, <laughs> to prove it to her. I'm like, I'm going to prove it to you. So I went home, I gathered all my sources and there's something that the LDS do. It's called, I said, Jesus, right? They kind of, yeah, they put their belief into the Bible. That's how they read it. So they've, they're they putting their filter onto the Bible instead of exegesis, which is you read it and you're like, okay, what does it say? And so you're not trying to impose your filter on it. And so I was doing what Mormons do. I was 
picking out those verses that sounded like it could be pointing to us becoming gods. And I started to write the email to her listing all these verses. And I very distinctly had a very strong impression, which I know it was not of me, where it was like, stop, it's not true. I just started to cry. I'm like, what? It's not true. Like in that one moment, God just kind of showed me that what James had been trying to tell me for months, but I wouldn't listen, that the the first person to say that we could be as gods, it wasn't God. It was Satan that said it. And we received that. You know, so we receive that in Mormonism as truth and it's, he's the liar of all liars. And so anyway, that was huge that I started, that I finally realized, okay, we can't become gods. And on top of that, in that moment, I also had that realization, well, what the Bible says that there is one God has to be true. And so, so poor James, he comes in, he sees that I'm crying and I share with him what happened. And I think he was so happy, like thinking I had just turned the corner, but I'm like, I still wasn't ready to receive it. I just thought, well, Joseph Smith, he got crazier as he went on, you know, in his, in his ministry. And so I just thought, well, I just think Joseph Smith, maybe he started to get too arrogant and he just veered off. But if you look at the Book of Mormon, there's actually some verses in there. It's not quite the Trinity. It's a, it's off, but it sounded like at some point when he was writing the Book of Mormon that he was maybe believing in a God that was three in one. It's called modalism, though, so it's not quite right. It's a heresy, but anyway, so I so I still shelved it and continued on. And then God did a few other things where he just started, he just continued to peel me until one day I was, I was at her house, my, our friend's house. And, and I'm fast forwarding a bunch. There was a lot of peeling, but I don't want to make it too long. But um, she was, um, she'd often share stories, oh, miracle stories. Like that's one thing that really spoke to me about Christianity is in Mormonism. Never saw miracles except for like, oh, you know, somebody had a surgery and it was successful, but actual like priesthood blessing, like, or, you know, this person was healed. I never heard of anything that really was a miracle in my eyes. And so she would share crazy stories. Like one time, I always remember this one where there was a lady in her congregation who had, you know, was just very close to having her baby, but then they went to check the baby's heartbeat and the baby had died. And so they were going to have to have her deliver the baby. And that was like on a Friday, it was, they were going to force the delivery on Monday, but she felt very strongly. She was supposed to go pray. She prays for the baby and the mom, and she just kind of touched her belly and the baby came alive. Monday morning, they went and checked the baby's heartbeat was going. I mean, she had stories like this all the time of just like where people were just healed and um, her husband, oh my goodness, they would go to uh, Israel many times. They had done many tours there. And he was, um, he was a big military guy, like worked at the Pentagon. Um, crazy stories with that. They went to Israel once and he had um, prostate cancer and he decided to get baptized in the River Jordan. And she said he was, it was their last trip. He was, he was stage four, doing pretty badly, could hardly walk, got baptized. She said when he came out of the water, his face was just like glowing. And she said the rest of the trip, he was walking better and better to where he didn't even need his cane anymore. And he was completely healed. It was amazing. So stories like that. And I was like, oh my gosh, we don't have power like that in the LDS church. And so that started to really speak to me. But one day she's sharing a story and she's getting teary eyed because she'd often miss him. And I would say, you know, do you wish, you know, in Mormonism, how we're very focused on the dead. And I'm like, do you wish that um, he would do something, you know, flicker a light or just something to show you he's nearby. And she's like, oh no, I don't go there. She, the Bible is very strict about that. You're not supposed to speak to the dead. And I didn't even think anything of what she said in that moment. But a few months later, I had some quiet time alone. I was at a work retreat for the CPA firm I was working with. I decided that night, oh, I'm just, I've got this quiet. I don't, you know, because I'm a homeschool mom. I was homeschooling and working at the same time, this little busy time in my life. And and so I sat there, I just read the scriptures that night, just had quiet time. The next morning I woke up to, to see the sun go up and was praying and just um, reading the scriptures. And all the time, this whole time, since James and I 
in the wrong page, you know, on different pages, I would pray like, God, please just show me your truth. I'm just tired of hearing so many voices. I just need you to tell me. And so um, that morning after I was done praying and I was about to head off to the retreat, I was going through some emails and saw one that was from a good friend that was in the Denver Snuffer movement that said that Denver Snuffer had a visitation from Joseph Smith. And I don't know what it was in that moment because Denver Snuffer was always claiming to have visions and stuff. But in that moment, I got a pit in my stomach, kind of like the one James described when he read his book. And I was like, and then I remembered my conversation with my friend about not speaking to the dead. And because she said, the reason is, is because there's room for deception. And then, then everything came flooding. And I was like, oh my goodness, the whole Mormon church it's, it's none of it can be true. There's no way because God, if this, if this restoration was the most important thing that ever happened, it, it couldn't, it, God never would have broken his own commandments to restore it. And the way he restored it is by sending angel Moroni, who wasn't, well, the book of Mormon's not really true, but if he, if it was, then angel Moroni was a prophet. He would have been a dead prophet appearing to Joseph Smith to give him all these instructions of where the plates were and all this. And so I'm like, oh my gosh. And then just thinking about the restored keys, right? Like the keys of the priesthood and the keys of proper baptism, all the dead prophets that came and gave him instruction. And I realized God would never have done that. So at that very moment, I was ready and and I knew none of it was true because it never could have been. It was the most freeing, joyful moment that I had ever had in my life. And I couldn't wait to come home and tell James. And then as I read home, as I um, went through the day, I couldn't wait to get home. We were, I was in Tucson, it was an hour and a half away from home. And he had been on a men's retreat for church and had been playing um, football um, with some guys, dove over somebody, right? And he, and his ribs, like he hurt his ribs, but he had told me when I, we were kind of passing each other when I went to the retreat and he was coming home and he said, well, I'm a little bit injured. And I just didn't think anything of it for just a split second. But then I'm like, okay, James never complains. And so it's like, can you expand on that? I was just texting him. What do you mean by that? Little bit injured. And he was like, well, I just think I separated some, some ribs. But on Monday, as the retreat's ending, he texts me and said, well, I went to the chiropractor and he tried to adjust to me, but I about passed out. And apparently he had the x-ray flipped. And when he went back to look at it again, when I almost passed out, he realized he had the x-ray flipped. And so he was looking at the wrong side and he actually did have a couple bros broken ribs and his, his, um, and a collapsed lung. So he was heading to the emergency room. So I rushed over there and just was, oh, just, oh my goodness, the procedures he had to go through to get him played. It was like, oh, so hard to watch him. But then at that, I, I thought, okay, I can't tell him right now in the midst of all this. So I told, I asked our daughter who was 17 at the time to go home and be with the boys and that I would stay the night with James and make sure he was okay. Cause he doesn't complain. So if, if I saw him pain, then I would tell the nurse. <laughs> and so the next morning I, as he was doing a little better and was in less pain, I crawled in next to him and, and I was like, I have something to tell you. And, and I gave him the whole story of my experience the day before. And it was just amazing. Like the darkness that lifted from us together, from that room, from our home, as I came to know like the truth that it just, none of it was true, was an incredible experience. And and then we've been walking with God and Jesus ever since. And it's been so worth it. I mean, yeah, definitely we, you know, have been a bit estranged from our family. They're not mean to us, but they definitely don't include us, but it's so worth it. Like every, everywhere we go and, and meet other Christians, it's like they're our family. And it's been a beautiful, now about seven and a half years since I came out, about nine and a half since James came out. That's where you probably want the update of what's happened since then. Well, <laughs> this is where I'm going to drop in that uh, okay. mid-podcast song because it's called Drop Baby Drop and it's about... <laughs> You know, liking each other. So you guys were back to liking each other again. <laughs> oh, yes. It's so good. It's so good. I, yeah. Every little move you make 
Yeah, so that's that's kind of, mm-hmm. I think, where we, we were last time. You guys had been kind of reunited for, a, mm-hmm. this is 2019 last time. So, yeah, yeah t- just kind of update says what's gone on since, uh, you know, you were on the podcast. Yeah, I think uh, once Jolene got on, and I got on the same page, then we needed to get out of town. You know, when you grow up in Mormonism, it's, that's your whole world, right? Your family, your friends, my career, the law firm, everything is centered around Mormonism. And coming out of that is, is not easy. And so I felt like we just needed our space. And so that was one of the reasons why we went to Hawaii. Plus, we just loved it. Uh, it's a place that we visited every couple of years, and and we had a special place in our heart for it. So, so yeah, we went to the Big Island and spent three years over there. Just had a great, great time. Yeah, we have our um, three kids were there with us. Yeah, I mean, you know how it is. You just miss the just being so close to the ocean. Did lots of paddle boarding. Played lots of tennis. I'd still come back to to Arizona every month for my for my work. Yeah, about three years into it, that's when COVID hit and some changes happening in our in our life that brought us back here. So yeah, update on my life, Jolene. So if if you uh, listen to my story, you'll be like, did is that even the same story? <laughs> it's like <laughs> the, the, like perspective of us going through it and you know what um, you know, what hit home for us over those tough years. But looking back, yeah, just it's it's good to be on this side of it, you know, where we had some hard years in our marriage. Not knowing, you know, like Jolene said, you know, when you come out of that known, you know how it is. It's like your whole life is laid out for you, right? Your life and the life of your kids. And you come out of that, you're like, I don't know what's around the corner anymore. And that's both very freeing and also very scary at, at well, the same time. Well, and Jolene even touched on that for some people, that pendulum swings so far the other way. A lot of people feel like when people leave a high demand religion, they just don't want any religion. <laughs> and And that's true for a lot of people. But a lot of people like yourselves, that's not the case. And it's not the case for our daughter Tatum, yeah. you know, and her husband, Jack. So, and I always tell people, hey, for me, I'm just accepting of anybody who's just trying to be a good human and live a good life. 
But I think it's important to tell tell folks what you guys are doing now and what you're doing, James, what yeah. you've gone through, because yeah. it's, it's it's a big change, uh, especially, like you say, from knowing everything to, you know, maybe, yeah. quote, being able to say, I don't know everything, but I'm open to learning more. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Yeah. And that's that, that's very true. It's like when, when you come out and you, you you don't know what's what's ahead. Like for me, it, it's funny because I never thought I would go back into religion, right? And I think that's probably the usual response, right? Coming out of Mormonism is like, okay, I've been fooled once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, right? And so I think I'm probably more surprised than anybody as to the, the path that I've ended up. Um, and, and and certainly uh, as, a, as a Mormon, you would never consider just Orthodox historical Christianity, right? Because you were taught that the uh, that's kind of a lesser version of Christianity, right? And Mormons have that plus much more. And so I was surprised, um, you know, as I was looking into it and just started reading the Bible for myself and, and kind of like Jolene said, just reading it for what it says, you know, versus me imposing my my view of it. I'm like, wow, I actually don't believe most of this. I thought I believed in the Bible. And, you know, it, it, the, the, um, the way it portrays God and, and and the good news of what Christ has done for us is completely different than what you learn in Mormonism. And, you know, what uh, for, in Mormonism is always about being worthy, right? I need to pass these interviews. I need to check off these boxes. I need to go to the temple. It's all I need to be doing more and more so that I can be be worthy. And Christianity is just the, the cold, hard truth of, no, we're all broken, <laughs> unworthy sinners. There is no being worthy here. You know, it's like we're looking to God and looking to Jesus for what he did for us. It's not about what I'm doing for him. It's about what he's done for us. And that completely changed my my perspective and lifted up, lifted up so much guilt and shame that I grew up with. What brought us out of Hawaii was so COVID hit, and that was making my trips back to Arizona harder. I was always in quarantine. Hawaii had a real strict quarantine there, and I was also uh, beginning seminary. I was just starting to attend a seminary in Portland, and actually my classes were in Boise. The schools in Portland, but but my classes were in Boise. And so I was making two trips back a month for a seminary and also for work and COVID. And then our kids were just getting at a different season of life, getting ready to start high school. The schools over there were a bit rough. And so um, we just decided we're going to come to, to Utah. It's kind of in between place between Arizona and Boise where I was traveling. And uh, it, it was so interesting because I, I had not been back to Utah since uh, I went to BYU Law School. And so it had been decades since I'd been back. And, and to see, uh, I mean, you've seen it, right? I mean, the culture is shifting so much here, you know, as there's more and more people coming out of the Mormon church and more people moving into Utah from the outside. And so it's becoming more diverse. And, and yet um, it's, it's been real neat to, to be here to walk with people through their journeys as they're going through things that we did. And you see, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's like, it's all very similar, right? You know, as you've, you've met with people and talked sure. with people that come out and it's like, there's similar parts and yet it's also so different for everybody as well. And we've enjoyed just walking life with people as they're having that faith crisis and see, you know, there's actually something better on the other side you should consider. And so it's been really neat to be part of that. So that's been my, my life the past four years then has been uh, attending seminary and still working the law firm. And I'm just graduating from this, this master's program in seminary um, next week. And so I have the, the graduation ceremony next week. And we are moving to, to St. George. Here we are following Larry and Judy again. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we met him in Gilbert. We followed them to Hawaii. And here we are in St. George again. <laughs> yeah, but... but- what do you? What is your ultimate goal, though, for coming here? Though you yeah. you have something in mind that you're going to do. Yes, yeah, and so we are going to be, be they call it planting a church, um, and that's a bit Christianese. But so we belong to a small church in Sandy, Utah. It's called Crossroads Church, and it's just an independent um, uh, little Baptist church. A couple hundred people can go there. And kind of our philosophy as a church is when we, because the building's pretty small, and when we get too full, well, then we like to plant churches in other areas. And and so I'm one of the leaders there over the church. And so Jolene and I have kind of had it on our heart for some time to go and and, uh, plant a church out of Crossroads. And so it's like a sister church of the church that that we belong to. And, And so we've been 
thinking it's been over a year now that we've kind of been considering where there's been different opportunities that have come up and we've made a number of trips to St. George and, and St. George has grown in our hearts as a place that we really love and enjoy. And so as we just have considered more, we've decided, you know, uh, so St. George is going to be the place where we plant this church. And so, yeah, so that's the, the, the main reason behind it. We're excited. It's going to be a place where we can just really settle in, we hope. We, we hope we don't move again. <laughs> and we really enjoy this area, a place where we hope just to be able to pour into the community and see what St. George has for us and come and uh, we'll, we'll, we get a we, we do a Bible study. We've been doing it the last few years at our house um, every Friday night. And it's been amazing to see how God is just bringing people together for this Bible study. We do about 10 weeks and then we'll start over with a new group. And every time it's filled with 15, 20, 25 people that are coming. And and it's not a it's not like a Mormon bashing Bible study. It's just people come. We open up the Bible together and, and I try to show them just the beautiful story of of God of who he is as 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 it is in the bible and as the mormons are hearing that it's just amazing you know to kind of see them go through it and and they're like Wow, this kind of like me. It's like I thought I knew the Bible, but I actually don't. Most of them have never actually read it, right? Mm -hmm. As Mormons, it's kind of always on the back shelf and something that you, you you know the main stories, but you've never really dived into it. And to see this beautiful story come together from beginning to end, the Bible. I think the best uh, evidence for the Bible is just the story that it is a cohesive story written over fifteen hundred years, all pointing to Jesus and what He came to do for us. And 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 I love just laying out that story for people. It's become a passion of mine. And, and so we'll be kind of getting that together here and over time, see what God has. And when the time is right, we'll get the church going. We don't know what the name of it will be. Um, we're, we're just going to pick a name, but, but we do know underneath it'll be uh, where the unworthy gather. Um, we, 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 we want our church to be a place where everybody feels welcome because we are all broken sinners to come and, 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 and allow Christ to come and transform us in new ways. I don't know a whole lot about churches, but will it be under the like non-denominational umbrella? So technically, we are uh, of Baptist denomination. Okay. Um, Baptists by nature, what, what makes them unique is there is no governing body over the Baptist denomination. They believe that each church is independent and has local autonomy. And so, um, yeah, in, in our, you know, there are different denominations. They all agree on the core essentials of Christianity, but they have different distinctives. And so we've lined up mostly with the Baptists as far as uh, just their, their, their emphasis on, on, on just good, solid Bible preaching. Um, you know, no, I don't just get up there and just start pontificating on my views of life. It's, you know, really grounded in the Bible, and we appreciate that, having the, the Bible as our anchor. And so that's a distinctive of a Baptist. But yeah, so it's it's connected to the Baptist, but yet it is a local autonomous church um, that okay. has a lot of freedom as far as how we decide to do it in this culture here, because every place is different. And you're going to keep working as an attorney. But, yep, that's the plan. And so I will be what's called bivocational. I will sometimes have on my pastor hat and sometimes have on my attorney hat and do both. <laughs> will the kids then all come here as well? So we have uh, our two boys. Um, yeah, so um, Ashton, is uh, he's going to stay behind in Salt Lake because he started his chemical engineering program at the U, University of Utah there in Salt Lake. So he's going to stay there. And Ethan, our youngest, he's 16. He's going to be coming with us, finish up his senior year. And maybe he'll stay. Maybe he won't. I, I hope he does. We'll miss our kids. We have our, our daughter. Uh, she married, got married last spring, married a really neat guy. And they're actually in Ephraim. So they're kind of in between Salt Lake and here. Okay. And uh, they're part of a little ministry there. It's right across the street from Snow College, a little coffee shop. Um, Snow College is a very heavy Mormon <laughs> um, college. And so there's a, a missionary couple years ago opened up a coffee shop across the street from this Mormon college. And, you know, it's like one of the first things you do when you're questioning Mormonism, you go rebel and have a cup of coffee. Right? <laughs> Except for me, I, I think I probably started uh, 15 years before I left Mormonism. <laughs> But that's okay. You were way ahead of the curve. <laughs> I, and you know, it, it's it's funny because people say, why would you do that when you were still, you considered yourself Mormon? I go, well, because I was into running. And at the time I read an article about the health benefits of drinking coffee. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to try it. And you know what? It really helped me yeah. in a healthy way. Now, I didn't drink five cups a day. I drank one cup. 
but it really, I found it very beneficial. And that's when I quit drinking sodas. And so I haven't had it. I haven't had a soda in, I'm, I'm coming up on 10 years, you know? So, you but were, anyway, you were a free thinker that I was, that I was convinced <laughs> I, I couldn't go to the temple if I drank a cup of coffee. So. Well, I was, I was big on spirit of the law. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Well, right on. That's just amazing, though. So, and really, I mean, you guys, you actually just bought a home and closed on it today. Today. Like two hours ago. Today. Yep. <laughs> I'll give a plug for the best realtor, realtor in town, Larry Camp, yes. who helped us through it. Yes, uh, you he know, did amazing. <laughs> it, it's, it's just awesome that you guys are going to be here. And, and, you know, I think that's what I have found in, since leaving a high demand religion is just that there's, there's other things out there. I don't have all the answers. I tell people that all the time, but I'm okay not having all the answers too. And I've, I've said things like, I hope I see my son again. I hope I am reunited with my parents or with Judy's parents or with my brother who passed when he was 28. And, and I'm okay not having those answers. And I'm also okay that other people believe they do have those answers. I'm okay with that too, because 95% of my family and Judy's family are still very much in the you know Mormon world, mm -hmm. and a lot of our friends are a lot of my teammates on my softball team and people yeah. I play poker with and everything else, yeah. and that's okay. I think that we just have to, well the song that we opened with in this podcast is a song just about being okay that people are different because really at the end we're, we're all the same. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, no, I appreciate that about you. It's um. Yeah, I, th I think because uh, same thing with me. Most of my family, well, like there's ten kids, and um, eight of them are still very strong in the LDS Church. My parents have passed away actually since my last podcast. Both of them passed away. Yeah, I th it's um, what I've enjoyed about coming out of Mormonism, and as I looked into to biblical Christianity. I learned, you know, I don't actually have to check my brain at the door when I go to church. You know, I, I like being able to ask questions like you're, you're talking about to ask these questions. You know, we shouldn't be scared of the hard questions that we're facing in life. You know, this culture, there's a lot coming at us different, um, some, some good, some bad. And I think that we should be able to ask hard questions and find answers. And, and, and I love that I can do that now, you know, in Mormonism, I always felt like if, if I was asking questions, then something was wrong with me. I was lacking faith faith or whatever it might be. You know, in fact, I think it's one of their apostles who, who says that uh, he, he teaches doubt your doubts, right? If, if you have doubts about Mormonism, you should doubt those because we're telling you that's, you know, that's not from God. And, and I would say, no, trust your doubts, you know, go after your questions and find answers because um, God gave us brains for a reason to think through these things. Yeah. I think that questioning things is always a, a good thing. Yeah. And I, and it's not doesn't have to always be tied to religion. I'm just talking about anything. It could be politics. It could be something yeah. your neighbor's telling you about how to take care of your lawn. It could be, hey, yeah. do the research. You know, I mean, when people say, "What do you think takes a lot of people out of religion?" I'll say, "Google." That's so true. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> it really is. That's so true. <laughs> yeah. Larry, is it okay if we share? Like, um, Jeans has a website for the Bible study Absolutely. in case anybody wants to connect with us. Yeah, because I mean, this this podcast yeah. goes to like. 46 countries last time oh, I saw. Wow. So, I mean, there's people out there and, and I get notes back every once in a while because I mean, let's face it. If you're, if you're somebody who's active in the Mormon faith, you might find yeah. that a lot of the stuff we talk about to be like, Oh, I'm, you know, that's bashing or something. I don't think mm -hmm. it is. People are just mm -hmm. sharing their stories. Yeah. And I have plenty of people on here who are from other religions who yeah. are still active Mormons. I had my good buddy Rob yeah. on here. Who's on a mission with his wife in Seattle oh, right now. Okay. So, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just about, letting people tell their stories and, so and because cool. I live where I live and my, and my background is coming out of the LDS world, of course, I'm going to have a lot of LDS friends and family and, yeah, and that's just the way it is. So, yeah. but yeah, absolutely. Okay. Share it. Yeah. So it's ask LDS questions.com. Yeah, I think it's a dot com. And then also, um, I actually recently wrote our story and published it, just self-published it on Amazon. Um, it's called Into God's Arms by Jolene Phelps. So if you're kind of curious to kind of really get the nitty gritty of our story, um, that's out there actually as well on Amazon. It's a page turner. You won't be able to go to sleep. Yeah. Until you it. Yeah. If you had a lot of people like tell us that, 
it, they don't normally read, but they couldn't set it down. So <laughs> it's kind of uh, it's kind of fun. <laughs> well, good, and I'll put that in the notes as well. Oh, thank you. Okay, I'll send you the link. <laughs> Well, hey, guys, I sure appreciate you taking the time to kind of just bring us up to speed as to what you've been doing the last four years and Jolene for sharing your story. Yeah, I mean, everybody has a very unique story. I I still remember back when we were all together in Maui and we were on that canoe trip and we were out paddling. (laughs) And that's when Rinsley told Judy (laughs) that you guys were no longer going to church. And we still were at the time. I just remember saying, huh, that's interesting. Well, next time I get together with James, I'll have to ask him about that. <laughs> I think it was like a year later, but but that's when, you know, you kind of told me your story and you were mm-hmm. you were thinking about maybe moving to Hawaii and you did move to Hawaii. So yeah, it's just fun to kind of just circle back and, and just hear everything that you guys have been doing because who knew, right? Yeah. I mean, who knew that this is the path that you guys would take? But that's yeah. kind of what life's all about, right? It's just not being afraid maybe to sometimes take that other fork. Mm-hmm. You know, that we always hear about when, you know, you come to that crossroads. So I'm glad it's worked out for you guys and that you guys are united in what you're doing and very happy though. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. We are looking forward to the next season and being closer to you and Judy. Awesome. Yeah. We're excited. (laughs) Thank you, Larry. All right, everyone. Well, hey, check back in two weeks. We're going to have another interesting story right here on Nobody Knows Your Story. Aloha. Aloha. far away let's talk story it's where my mama was born it's where i come from it's where my daddy fell in love not long ago let's talk i